That seems good. All right, last couple stragglers. Ah, uh, yeah, microphones. Yeah, that that probably helps a little bit. <laughs> All right, well, we'll we'll just deal with it. Uh, so welcome everybody to B Sides Charm 2017. So, 327 B-Sides event overall, 216th global, so a whole lot of B-Sides. Um, 1,077 tickets this year, uh, and we sold out faster and faster and faster, as some of you found out as you tried to get tickets, uh, and Twitter exploded with tickets in the last few weeks, so that was kind of fun. How many people actually got their tickets via Twitter? Yeah, only a couple. Yeah, crazy. So, um, yeah. So, sponsors-wise, uh, we had one platinum this year with Lockheed Martin. Uh, several gold uh, with NSA, Sands, Hackhead, Raytheon, Booz Allen, Point three Talos, Tenable, Ceiling Tech, and Capital College or Capital Technology University, Trimark, Cyberry, and Aspect Security. So, a lot of awesome gold sponsors. Yep, they're all over in the sponsor room. Please go visit them. Uh, for silver sponsors, Dragos, Carbon Black, uh, Fun Times, Tapestry, Anchor Tech Technologies. Uh, for silver sponsors, also Traces, Grim, Howard County Economic Development Authority, uh, Net Craftsman G2, Iron Vine Security, and Novetta. And then for bronze, uh, Cobalt Strike, Dynaxis, and Symantec. We actually had a lot of other contributors who jumped in. Uh, ISC with coffee, and uh, CDW with some lovely tablets. Uh, 0.3 with lanyards, No Starch Hacker Boxes, and Hack 5 with some lovely giveaways. Nobody likes giveaways though, right? And then our lovely charities this year that we're supporting, Unallocated Space, Digital Harbor Foundation, Hackers for Charity, and Security Besides Global. Uh, so later on when we have t-shirts available, you can choose where your donation goes with those lovely poker chips. HFC has the table as well as Unallocated and Digital Harbor. So please go visit them as well. They are also in the sponsor village. Uh, badges. So, uh, some lovely electronic badges for our speakers, uh, or rather keynote speakers and staff, and those of you who elected to do the electronic badge option. And then we have blue for our attendees, white for speakers, trainers, and charities, red for our staff, and then green is the sponsors. Please visit them. They have tokens for coffee and later they will have drink tokens for the party. So you want to go talk to them if you want drinks. Uh, some lovely notes, some all the red badges and electronic staff badges, gray and red shirts, please listen to them. They make this event easier. Um, after the con, a link will be tweeted out if you're interested in helping as an organizer next year. Uh, pictures and social media, Please ask everybody in the picture if they're cool with it. Some people are, don't like that. Be courteous. All the talks will be recorded and online. We have Iron Geek here helping us this year, so they'll be up a little faster because Iron Geek is awesome. Uh, please use the hashtag. Uh, the Wi-Fi is available. Uh, this is the lovely uh, password. Uh, those are L's, not ones. That was fun because they got it wrong in the email when they read it and set it up, which was fun. So, fun mornings. Uh, the challenges over in the next room, we have the wireless CTF and point three, um, just the new name of their Escalate CTF. Uh, so, a Jeopardy style instead of uh, the round style they had last year. So. Hopefully a little more open for folks. Lockpick Village and then the tree training rooms. Um, no alcohol, smoking, vaping in the building. There's a patio outside for that. 
It's rather nice. Uh, feedback forms. These links will be on the website. Uh, using them may lead to prizes at closing. So, uh, yeah, if you want the prizes, closing. Um, please use the feedback forms. They're really helpful for us to be able to get your feedback to improve for next year. Uh, party location across the street. Pratt Street Ale House again at 8 p.m. Um, soda drinks. Uh, upstairs there will be crabs adjust humidity for those who aren't interested in drinking or just want to have fun heckling each other and being horrible people. Because it's fun. Uh, you will need to bring your badge to actually get into the party. So please bring your badge to the party. Otherwise you will have to go back and get it and that kind of sucks. Uh, again, tag us so that we can retweet all your awesome feedback and comments. That is it. So I'm going to turn it over to our introductory keynote speaker, Rob Lee. Yeah, so you guys want to uh, All right. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I'm going to kind of walk around a little bit. So uh, greatly appreciate everybody coming today. If we look at the uh, agenda, we've got a lot of really interesting talks. I don't know. How many of you have been to B-Sides before? Any, any B-Sides? All right. So that's a good returning number. means we've also got a lot of folks who are first timers. So if you are a first timer, really at B-Sides, you can just grab onto anybody, ask them what's cool to see, what's cool to do. Uh, they'll take care of you. So my name's Rob Lee, and I was asked to talk about industrial control systems, and specifically some research I've uh, been doing into industrial control system attacks recently. A uh, lot of interesting things out there, a lot of hype, uh, actually a lot of fear when it comes to the discussion of industrial systems. Uh, so I'll, I'll walk you through why it's such a challenge for the community to actually understand what's going on in this space. Uh, and talk a little bit about the things we've seen before, some things we need to be aware of, and then the research that's going on right now. Um, but really, as a, a keynote, I only have a couple jobs. The first, of course, is to run over my time slot and get everybody off track. Uh, that's, that's the first thing I'll try to do well. Uh, the second thing is to try to bring a tone to what we're doing uh, for the rest of the day. So Jim Chrissy, uh, as keynote tomorrow, he's going to tackle it very, very well and set the tone for tomorrow. My tone for today and a lot of what my focus is on is trying to push back on some of the hype we see uh, with good knowledge, making sure that people that are speaking about events in the media, that are speaking about uh, things to their friends, their peers, their, their parents, whoever it might be, that we do so from an informed position. And so that's what I'll be mainly focusing on here. So getting us going here. Uh, my background, uh, do a lot of different things, uh, teach at SANS, uh, run a company called Dragos, one of the sponsors. And uh, my background though, and the reason I'll highlight my background for the purpose of the talk, is I started out on the Air Force side of the house, uh, but spent my entire career in the intelligence community. And while there working for one of the intelligence agencies that seems to be less popular these days, uh, set up a mission looking at nation states breaking into industrial control systems. So the entire purpose of what we did was, can we find different targeted threats breaking into industrial sites, and what can we do about that from understanding and patterning out that activity to do better in the future for defense? And then, of course, I also uh, write a little comic called Little Bobby every Sunday. Is anybody actually familiar with this? A couple of you? Yeah, awesome. Uh, this all started out really because I found in the military that it was really uh, interesting to try to explain technical topics to leadership. And if I could break things down into little three pain comics, it was just way more entertaining to brief generals with that. Uh, so that's where it originated from. But I try to keep a little levity uh, with going on. So uh, here's our agenda today. I actually started out today walking through the wrong side of the conference. And I saw the audience. and I was like, wow. Besides charm, you finally solved the diversity challenge in InfoSec. <laughs> like, this is, this is awesome. 
unfortunately, it turns out the sorority is not part of uh, what we're doing today. Uh, but uh, I, do, I do like looking around and seeing the vast sort of different ages and diversity that we have. Uh, we should do better, though. It's a focus area for everybody. But here's what I'll talk about. A little, little bit more PC of topics. First of all, how are these things, these industrial control systems, these ICS attacks, how are these even done? There's a lot of misconceptions around what an attack is. A scan on your honeypot that you set up port 502 on to mimic Modbus is not an attack, and it is not a control system. So we've got to do a little bit better in the community. Uh, ICS cyber attacks, fact versus fiction. This is where I'll try to give you a historical perspective of what we've seen to date and what matters and really a lot of the hype we've seen. And then lastly, I'll talk to you about this project mimics that uh, one of my one of my folks, Ben Miller, has really been leading up on our team, looking at what we can try to return to the community in terms of some base metrics. Can, can we understand a little bit better around what are good metrics around things like ICS incidents around the community? And of course, little Bobby down here just saying, hey, Matt, uh, we need more scalable cloud-based threat intelligence and analytics and automated big data endpoint security solutions. Matt says, you have no idea what you just said, do you? He's like, nope, but I read it out loud and I got invited to speak at a conference. I figured if I uh, told three more people, I'd be a security expert. Matt says, yeah, that sounds about right. So that's, that's why I'm here. I end up saying the word cyber a lot and got invited to speak. So how are ICS attacks conducted? Well, uh, this one seems to be interesting of late. We've seen all sorts of things going on from shadow brokers to everything else. So little Bobby down at the bottom calling up uh, what looks maybe like Microsoft, depending on if they want to sue me or not, then it's not. Um, but little Bobby calling up saying, why don't you do more to protect me from nation state espionage? And the lady kindly replies, well, we, we want to, but while espionage gets a lot of media attention, uh, it impacts less than 0.1% of our customers. And little Bobby says, so you're saying I'm special. Uh, in general, what I like to highlight here before getting into how ICS attacks are conducted is there are a couple who've gotten most of the attention uh, in the community. There are the, the big ones that like I can't get through an ICS presentation without saying the word Stuxnet somewhere, and, and these things have controlled a lot of the narrative. Uh, but as I get through later in the presentation and, and pull out what's actually affecting the community, you'll see that you're far more likely to be impacted by some virus on a USB from the early 2000s than you are from nation state espionage. Um, it's cool and it's exciting and it's interesting sounding, but not necessarily what's actually impacting the community. All right, so how many of you have seen a kill chain before? Be honest, all right. How many of you have seen Lockheed's marketing team here? All right, good, so uh, kill chains are actually really, really important, uh, very much like Mike Klopper and the guys that came up with the first one. Uh, from a digital perspective. When looking at an ICS cyber attack, I want to set the bar here right up front of what's different. Uh, I authored a paper at SANS with Mike Asante titled The ICS Cyber Kill Chain. And it, the whole point of it was to say, look, in IT, in enterprise, and anything related to IT, that whole kill chain thing is really useful. It's not the preventative, whatever, let's do predictive anything kind of model. It is just let's put data into buckets and observe patterns. And I can do intrusion analysis by putting data into buckets. That's the whole point of the model. Um, but in IT, it kind of stops down on that actions on objectives. One of the things I would note for industrial control systems is that's when things get interesting. And in an industrial control system context, all of that stuff up front is just the first phase of an ICS attack. The next phase is after they get all of the information that might be useful, um, this is where we see them have an opportunity to pivot to stage two. This is where you would have to develop something. It could be knowledge on the systems, and it could be a malicious capability or both. You're going to have to test it because any, any smart adversary, and not all your adversaries are smart, I've met some of them, uh, but not, uh, but they're going, any smart adversary is going to test out their capability because you're not going to run six months of operations, multi-million dollar campaign, and then go, all right, hope this works, click. Like, that's not very likely to occur. Um, but testing actually doesn't have to be in a lab. It could be in other people's utilities. I've seen that where very small electric and water utilities who say, I'm not really interesting. No way anybody would ever target me. Uh, they uh, can get compromised and just be used as a lab for somebody that wants to set up their environment to test out capabilities instead of setting up an expensive ICS environment. 
Then there's going to be that delivery and installation and executing of the actual ICS attack. I'm going to flip back and forth here real quick. This, to me, demonstrates that there's an extended kill chain when it comes to ICS. There are more things an adversary has to do to achieve the types of attacks we're most concerned with. And that's one of the first key points I want to highlight. There is a lot of rhetoric in the community today, and I say the larger community, not even just information security, that the grid is going to go down, or, oh my gosh, uh, the pipeline is going to blow up and kill people. It's really, really difficult, like way more difficult than people give credit for it. Like, well, I could use Metasploit and pop the uh, human machine interface and I can uh, get remote access. Cool, now make the lights blink. There's a big gap between those two things. So there is an aspect that goes into these types of attacks that's really, really important to understand for any type of real defense. So let's use one case study before we get going. So for those of you that aren't super weird, like my team and I, that hang around with things that beep and, and, and uh, spin large turbines and things on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, a power grid. Uh, the easiest way to think of a power grid, make it real simple, there's generally three components to it, generation, transmission, distribution going to generate lots of power, either coal, nuclear, wind, uh, water, all sorts of different opportunities. Uh, I'm going to transmit that electricity over the big, big wires that people that live to it, they're like, the NSA is spying on me. And it's like, no, it's just a transmission line, calm down. Uh, and then there's the distribution side of the house. Distribution is your local sort of neighborhood. Um, for the last uh, 30 plus years, the security has been prioritized on generation and transmission. Because if you wanted to do the most damage, that's where you target. Makes the most sense. Um, so back in 2015, there was an attack in Ukraine that was the first attack that actually took down portions of a power grid. Uh, and it was done entirely against the distribution network. So it was interesting because that's kind of the soft underbelly around the world of what's not been as protected. Um, so let's break that down along that model real quick and then we'll get into some of the fact and fiction and what we can do about it. So what I've done on the left-hand side is structured that stage one and stage two kill chain. On the right-hand side, I structured out what happened in Ukraine, uh, and I put the full report up at the top. Uh, I was fortunate to be one of the investigators and, and got to uh, write the industry report on that attack. And, and so I'll walk you through really quick how that went down to bring some context to what we're really talking about here. So about six months before the attack actually occurred, which was December 23rd, 2015, so about six months before, um, the adversaries targeted uh, a couple of Oblenergos, which is their word for energy company, around Ukraine. Fairly simplistic, uh, normal things that you would expect. Let me send you an email, you know, tell you that you should open up the attachment. When you open up the attachment for the exploitation, it was just social engineering, they said, hey, if you want extra features, click enable on the macros. And everyone's like, I totally want more features. And uh, when they clicked enable on the macros, it dropped a piece of malware called Black Energy 3 to the systems, which then got access, um, gave remote access to the adversaries to come in, do some lateral movement, all the kind of things you would normally expect. That's what it would look like traditionally in an IT environment that's run of the mill, nothing too crazy there. Where it got interesting is that second stage. So what the adversaries ended up doing uh, was they found VPN access into the ICS. So they found remote access into the industrial control system networks themselves. And for the next six months, because all of that IT stuff took a matter of like three days, for the next six months, they operated inside that environment doing what a good defender would do. They mapped out the environment, tried to understand it, profiled the devices, figured out what they were dealing with, they learned the systems, and it took them about six months to learn these three different distribution management systems across three different regions of Ukraine. When it came time for the actual attack, when we see it finally uh, on December 23rd, uh, there was a lot of other stuff they had done beforehand. So if you're just waiting for that attack, you've missed all of the actual activity, right? So if we look at what they actually did, a couple cool things, a little bit of hat tip to the adversary. First, they found that there was these devices called serial to ethernet devices. So if you ever play around with industrial control systems, a lot of serial protocols still out there. Uh, one of the devices that you need to be able to communicate from something like a control center that's communicating over the internet or ethernet um, would be uh, ethernet packets. But down at the substation level where they're doing distribution, probably got a lot of serial. 
So there's a device called a serial to ethernet converter. We're not very creative in the ICS community. But anyways, so serial to ethernet converter. Um, they found these devices. There's about 30 of them. And if you've ever done a firmware update to a control system, you just fail sometimes. It happens. It's not a big deal. Just reset the system and stores it in memory, flush it out. Not a big deal. So if you ever try to upload, you're going to fail sometimes. But these guys found the 30 devices and developed specific malicious firmware for those devices. The reason I, I feel pretty confident in saying it's specific malicious firmware is because, and the reason I'm confident that they tested is because when it came time for the attack, they had a 100% success ratio of bricking all the devices in exactly the same controlled manner. That's pretty good. Remotely, right, that's, that's pretty good too. So anyways, developed out, tested. They also had to develop knowledge on the distribution management systems themselves. Because when it, the real portion of the attack, all they did was remote desktop out the human machine interface, the little graphical thing that shows you how to open breakers and close circuits and things like that. They just remote desktoped it out and used the systems against themselves. So they used the natural ICS systems to actually disconnect the environment. They also modified the UPS. Uh, so they had a backup power system and they said, hey, uh, when the power goes down, we want you to maintain power, but then I want it to set about 30 minutes into it where it drops power then reboots all the systems, and then drops it again and drops the network interface card, which seems kind of weird uh, until you realize that a piece of malware they put all over the Windows environment, between 500 and 600 Windows systems, uh, a little piece of malware called Kill Disk, that it was set to activate upon restart, and it deleted the master boot record and all the systems. So if you're the defender, around 3.30 in the afternoon, because nothing ever happens in the morning, Around 3.30 in the afternoon, your mouse starts moving in front of you. You're like, uh-oh, this is not good. Uh, one of the guys actually took out a cell phone to record it. It was like, my boss is not going to believe this. And so you see the little mouse moving around. And uh, you start seeing breakers, starting to open up those breakers and starting to de-energize uh, those substations. Tries to fight it back. And if, again, if you're the defender, try to fight for control, get locked out. Power, you just start seeing it go out across the region. Then the power goes down, then it comes back up, and you're like, Phew, and then all your systems delete themselves. It's like, uh-oh. Uh, in, in that moment, that is a tough position to be in. And I was actually pretty proud of the Ukrainians because they were able to get back up their operations in about six hours, which is amazing. Um, but they did it by going to manual operations. It means they had engineers that went back out to the field and knew how to manually control the substations. They left the automation, the Windows stuff, the control systems, and went to manual operations. The reason I highlight that particularly, because I've heard a lot of wrong narratives come out of this attack. If you're at all interested in it, you go and do your research, you will find some camps of people who will say, oh, well, it was pirated software, or Ukraine's just insecure, or uh, as Tim Conway says, that's, that's the other side of the internet. Like, that couldn't happen here. Uh, and, and while I'll note that the American grid has done fantastic job of actually doing security, uh, and, and they've definitely upped their game over the last decade. Uh, nothing about that attack is specific to Ukraine. You, you could repeat the exact same thing. The difference is it would be harder to take us down, but in my opinion, keynote and opinion, it'd be easier to keep us down um, because a lot of that expertise in manual operations, you know, that's leaving the workforce. We've got a lot of people that get a little salt and peppery in the beard that are not sticking around for iPad HMIs. And uh, we're seeing a lot of young people come in the workforce, which is great, that are heavily reliant on automation and what their screen tells them. So in those type of scenarios, the ability to go back to manual operations is a skill set we're losing over time. So this is why defense matters. To me, this is a great example of quit focusing on the malware. It wasn't malware that took down the grid. It was human operators using the systems against themselves. So cool little case study. Let, let's get into the fact and fiction and some of the research that we're doing. So, uh, little Bobby here talking to the CSO. The CSO says, I need you to ensure no attacks occur. And little Bobby says, well, you know, what's our budget? He goes, oh, no, 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 We had to cut all that budget stuff out. And little Bobby says, well, I can assure you we will never see any attacks. Uh, and to me, that is one of the interesting things about the ICS community. I continually hear, hey, if it was so you know, important for threats to be able to compromise the grid, why don't we see more outages? Well, 
Sometimes things happen that we just blame on stupid activity that might be cyber related, but also there's a geopolitical context to doing those type of attacks. And it's not really in the best interest of some states to be able to do that all the time. That being said, there's a huge lack of research in this community, which drives a lot of the lack of visibility into the threats. So let's look at what that does to the community. When there's a huge interest by a populace, so a lot of people are interested in ICS, uh, maybe not you all, I see a couple glazed over looks. We'll see, we'll, we'll get there, don't worry, we'll get there. All right, so um, there's a lot of interest and not a lot being reported, which leaves this chasm. This chasm is naturally filled by hype. People just make up stuff. Happens all the time. Like, I'm an ICS expert, and there's 30,000 attacks around the industry. Look in the background, they're like the chief marketing officer for some startup, and you're like, mm, okay. So you gotta be very careful in the community. One of the first cases we saw where this occurred was 2011 at the Illinois Water Utility. So th those of you in the ICS community, I see like Jim and a couple of people like smiling. This was a fun one. So what had happened was, uh, it was the year after everybody learned that ICS was a thing, because Stuxnet happened in 2010, and everyone was like, ooh, SCADA. Uh, and uh, people were really, really interested, and the Illinois State Fusion Center was like, let's watch for attacks, because that's what they should do. And what ended up happening is a pump failed, like a water pump out at like, an out, like a little small station, failed. And by EPA regulations, by state regulations, they had to report up that failure. So they said, hey, we had a pump, it failed. And the state fusion center, the people getting involved were like, oh, I bet it's a cyber attack. <laughs> and there's a lot of reasons pumps fail. Cyber attack is not really likely. Uh, anyway, so they're freaking out. And they go and they drive out and they're like, show us your logs. And they actually had logs, which I think is pretty awesome anyways. Um, but they had logs and they were like, look. And the state fusion center people and some of the uh, folks that got involved looked at the logs and they saw that there was a Russian IP address three months before the attack. Which you would think like maybe that's just not the right time correlation, but well, it's okay. Anyways, three months before the attack, Russian IP address logged in with credentials that he obviously stole and accessed the pump and three months later it failed. That's a correlation causation fallacy, but either way, they're all fle freak, uh, freaking out. They ended up leaking it to the Washington Post and a couple others because, you know, that's why we can't have nice things. Uh, and so, you know, leaked it out to the media and the media is going wild and Bloomberg publishes an article, Russian cyber attack or maybe it's the Iranians pretending to be Russia, then they're attacking because they're pissed off about Stuxnet and this is just war. And it's like, whoa, calm down, guys. Uh, the guy who did it, <laughs> uh, the guy who actually remoted in, it, he was just on vacation in St. Petersburg a couple months before. And so he logged in because they asked him to. And he learned about it in Bloomberg on, online. Like, if anybody would have just asked him, he would have been like, yeah, that's totally me. And um, <laughs> turns out there was just a lot of buildup and residue on the pump, and that's why it's failed. If you looked at it and saw the old buildup, and it was like 20 years old, you're like, that pump's going to fail. So a uh, little, little bit of hype. Uh, the Chattanooga APT, so this was fun. So this is Stephen, this is Stephen Hilt. Uh, so Bloomberg again, it's not always Bloomberg, it's just always Bloomberg. Anyway, so Bloomberg comes out and uh, they said, look, we're gonna do this research to find ICS cyber attacks. So they started anchoring themselves and how they were gonna look in the community. And they said, we are gonna look for this stuff and we're gonna partner with this uh, honeypot vendor. It's ThreatStream, now they're Anomaly. They do better stuff now that they're Anomaly. Um, but started off and they said, we're gonna partner with a honeypot vendor to build ICS honeypots and uh, we're gonna look for nation state attacks, which is like correlation you just shouldn't do out loud. But anyways, um, so Stephen Hill, or the, they published the article saying, look at this, the number one AT in the, a APT in the world is the United States with over 6,000 attacks on control systems coming out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Because um, that's where we put the big NSA headquarters. Anyway, so um, everyone is freaking out. They published a national article about this. And Stephen Hilt finally pipes up and says, no, I, I think that's me. And they did like research and that's what it was, is it was Stephen. He was doing research ahead of a talk to look for ICS connected to the internet. And he found what, in his words, a really crappy honeypot that was trying to pretend to be ICS, so he just pelted it with scans. And, <laughs> and they started indexing his every scan against the honeypot as an attack and reported this out. So, you know, maybe some qualifications are needed. Can't get through a hype talk without talking about Norse. All right, so uh, 
Norris had put out this article one time. I get this phone call at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Like I was still in the government at the time it came out. And I get this phone call like, ring, 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 3 o'clock in the morning. Like, hello? I'm like, is Iran coming? I'm like, what? Like, is Iran coming? I'm like, I, I, this is a really weird phone call, man. Like, I, I don't know what to do right now. And they said, well, this is so-and-so on the National Security Council. And I don't have to tell you much about military ranks to say, Captain Lee, National Security Council report to the president. There's a gap. There's like a huge gap. I'm like, why are you calling me? <laughs> and they're like, well, we got this report about ICS attacks. You do the ICS stuff as if the government only has one person. And uh, they're like, we're getting ready to brief the big guy <coughs> off this report. We got to know if Iran's preparing a cyber offensive. And I'm like, I'm, look, it's, this is not a secure line. It'll take me like 15 minutes to get to work, but I can tell you. And they're like, no, it's coming from a vendor report. I'm like, hmm, go ahead and just send it on over. And I get this report from Norris that, it was bad. Uh, it was basically honeypot data. Again, and they, they didn't know what ICS was. They were like, all these scans against this specific range and this port is ICS. And it's a televent system. And I'm like, well, first of all, port allocation isn't what a control system is. And I was like, but second of all, um, TCP or UDP? And the guy's like, what? C the CTO of Norse is like, why does it matter? And I'm like, oh, oh, no, no, no. Like, this <laughs> This is going to be embarrassing for you. I'm like, is it, is it TCP or UDP? And the guy's like, it's TCP. I'm like, ugh. UDP is the port for Telvent. The TCP port on the same thing as the Symantec updater. That's not a good report. Um, and the interesting thing is they ended up putting out this article uh, later on as well. They decided to run with it because why not? You know, don't listen to me. And uh, they ran with it with a, a think tank called AEI. They, Fred Kaplan and those folks authored part of the Bush surge strategy, very influential folks in DC, very right-wing conservative think tank. And uh, they made policy decisions. They made policy recommendations saying, hey, the nuclear negotiations with Iran, which were happening at the time, should fail because Norse's data proves that Iran is gonna use the relief to attack control systems in the United States. So the hype has impact. It's, it's hilarious. But it has impacts. Policymakers look to our community. Uh, ICS is a topic that everyone's interested in and almost no one seems to have experience in. Um, so why does this matter again? Well, we, we see another case where Bloomberg, <laughs> I said it's not always Bloomberg, but it kind of is. Um, Bloomberg puts out this article saying, hey, this pipeline that exploded in 2008, which it did, it did explode in 2008. They said, we found out in 2014 that's a long instant response case, by the way. I would love to have that hourly rate. Anyway, so uh, in 2014, we figured out that it was a cyber attack by Russia. I'm like, okay, dig into it. I'll, I'll skip to the punch. They're wrong. And uh, it turns out they found like a piece of malware in a control center and just assumed that the explosion that happened must be related to the malware because there couldn't possibly just be malware there. And it beaconed out to a Russian IP address. They're like, it's Russia. I'm like, that's not how we do attribution. And um, the other interesting thing about this, though, and I try to kill this story at every conference I go to because Turkey came out at the time and said, it was the Kurds. <laughs> and they did this. And the Kurdish extremists came out and they were like, it was totally us. <laughs> and, and like seven years later, somehow Russia is getting blamed. So uh, the reason I bring this up, though, is I've seen congressional members reference this story as a reason to regulate the gas pipeline industry. Now, if you want to have a regulation discussion, let's chat. Uh, but we don't need to be seeing fake stories uh, causing changes in our community. And again, why does it matter? Well, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple more quick case studies and move on. But in Turkey, a uh, power outage occurred back in what, 2016, 2015. And it was a 10-hour outage across a couple different plants. And people were freaking out like, Surely multiple plants can't just go down. This happened recently, like San Francisco and New York, and they're like, it's gotta be a cyber attack. I'm like, you have no evidence. Like, it could be a fish. I don't care. Just don't make it a cyber attack. Um, it turned out to just be a circuit breaker. Anyway, so, uh, in, in Turkey, folks, major, major news outlets, CNN, um, yeah, Bloomberg was there too, but like CNN and stuff, other people were coming out and saying, power outage in Turkey. And based on the Norse data about Iran and based on the Bloomberg report about the BTC pipeline, this might be a cyber attack from Iran to Turkey. I want you to let, let that sink in for a second. For the first couple hours, maybe days, 
If you're the host country, you have no idea what's going on. It takes time to do investigative work. And for that first day or, or more, you're getting told by major news outlets that it's probably a cyber attack from a country you're not very friendly with. That is a very interesting geopolitical tense time over nothing but hype. Um, Israeli cyber attack that never happened. Uh, basically, the, they were having a, a conference in Tel Aviv being like, Tel Aviv is pretty sweet at cybersecurity because that's what Tel Aviv says. And uh, the guy, one of the ministers for the government gets up, and he's the minister over in charge of energy and, and water resources, and says, right now, as this conference is taking place, the Israeli Electric Authority is under the most severe cyber attack Israel has ever had. And he goes, oh my, oh my gosh. So again, CNN and everybody else ran this screenshot, ran this view. Israeli power grid suffers massive cyber attack. What he forgot to leave out in the details was the Israeli Electric Authority is a regulatory body that doesn't even touch the grid. It's just a little office with like 30 computers. And it was a ransomware infection because they opened up an email wrong. So uh, maybe, again, maybe a little bit better. And then this one, last one, this one was recently. Um, we started seeing this, and luckily Ron Fabella and some folks jumped on it very quickly. Uh, we saw this article come out saying, clear energy malware is taking advantage of these clear energy vulnerabilities. By the way, don't name your vulnerabilities. And if you do, don't name it the same thing as the malware. Everybody hates that. Just please. All right, so. Uh, clear energy malware, what it does is it locks down control systems, infects them, erases the logic, and then shuts off everything. Well, that's crazy for an ICS person that's like, that's not good. Um, what they didn't tell everybody is there was no malware and it did nothing. It seems to be a gap. Um, what they were trying to say, well, I mean, they were trying to say that, but what they should have said was, hey, we found some vulnerabilities. We weren't getting enough press coverage. So we made the malware ourselves and ran it in our lab to show that it still doesn't work in the lab. Um, so uh, again, a little bit of hype there. I, I feel bad for the company because I reached out to them and they were totally friendly about it. It was just marketing gone wrong. Uh, but but get, a, get a hold of your marketing team. All right, so let's start transitioning out of the hype stuff. Here's an abbreviated history of some ICS threats. First of all, insiders, people with actual knowledge, They've done some stuff before, right? The Marushi water case, if you're interested, go look it up. Basically reversing the flow of sewage by a disgruntled employee. Um, not awesome. Uh, lots of stuff can go on. But if I asked any general audience and I said, point out the one that's been most impactful to the community, everyone would be like, Stuxnet. Or, you know, like start whispering to each other, rocking back and forth, Stuxnet. And uh, we're talking about any of another one. Like, well, Dragonfly was far reaching or Sandworm. They took down the Ukraine grid. Um, the number one impact to the community has probably been like conficker, like incidental incidental malware infections. Uh, I love to explore nation state stuff because it's awesome to ruin bad people's day. It just is fun. You spent two years developing this, and I'm just going to write a snort rule for it. That's awesome. Like this, it's fun. But what is the actual impact in the community? It's, it's the incidental stuff. It's the operators who are bringing in USBs. It's the laptops that are still dirty. It's the vendor connections with direct VPN access that get infected. People are like, why don't you just patch your system? It's not that easy. Don't start there. Or I always get this stuff like, ICS is totally insecure. They have default passwords. And it's like, yeah. But what's more likely, the operator forgets his password and accidentally kills somebody, or Russia gets down into the control system network and goes, damn, a password. <laughs> like, you know, it's a risk perspective. Um, but, but that's where the mimics research, that's the stuff that I'll talk about for the, the last half of the presentation. Um, basically, we wanted to figure out what are real metrics around this? What are, what are we really seeing in the community that's not getting reported? And the big question is why. So let me, let me give you an example of why. So you already heard the hype piece. But what about the real numbers? So um, whether you like the metrics or not, and there's a good debate to be had, the most authoritative metrics previously that have been put out were from the, the Department of Homeland Security's ICS CERT. So the ICS CERT, they do a lot of cool things in the community, they're very, very proactive, good folks. But every year they put out their metrics of the incidents they're seeing. And they've said, you know, last year we saw 300 incidents, the year before that 260, so forth, so forth. Energy is the number one targeted sector. No, it's not. You're just actually like focusing on energy, so you see a spike in metrics. But either way, um, they put out this every year. And it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but every single year, the number one attack vector, like how do these things occur, the number one attack vector every single year in those metrics is unknown. They have no clue. Number two, which makes up the big green spot, 
is spear phishing. And everyone's like, yeah, that totally makes sense. No, it doesn't. We don't have email in SCADA environments. So what it's saying, what the metrics actually say is, when we see something, it's because IT caught it going through the business networks. Otherwise, we have no clue what's going on. And that is a problem, because without that visibility, without understanding how the attacks are taking place, understanding how the incidents are taking place, you leave that chasm for the hype we just talked about, but you also just copy and paste IT security solutions and IT security best practices into the ICS, because that's what you know, and it's not necessarily the stuff that actually fixes what's going on. Um, so this is, these metrics are what really started this idea of let's do some research here. And I, and I know every, every time I present uh, these numbers, I always get at least one person to go, well, Dell SecureWorks said this, or FireEye said this, or these big vendors that are trustworthy said this. Let me, I mean, I, I like those vendors too, but let me draw a big disparity. When your AV company puts out, or your endpoint security solution, whatever we're calling it, these AI, it's not a thing, but whatever. Anyway, so um, when people put out and they say, here's what we're seeing, and here's the intrusion analysis, and here's our big threat intelligence report. Good threat intelligence reports are all based off intrusion analysis. You see the attack taking place, you pattern it out, and you, you uh, have observables. That has existed in IT because we've had those vendors that have endpoint security solutions and IDSs and firewalls and AV and whatever else, and it reports back, and it says, here's what we're seeing, and then analysts can use that data. We don't have that stuff, nor have we ever had that stuff in ICS. So your big vendor who is trustworthy on the IT security solution side of the house and the threats that we're seeing don't have the visibility. There's not giant reams of incident response data uh, for what's going on inside the ICS. So that's, that's part of the problem where we don't have that level of visibility. So let's get into what we try to do to, to find this out. So I had metrics on one hand, which were the ICS cert saying, there's 260 to 300 incidents that occur around the community each year. And I used to be in the government, so I generally don't like government metrics. <laughs> and I was like, well, we probably need to work on those. And on the right-hand side, I had vendors, um, we'll just discount Norse, but we've had like Dell SecureWorks come out and say, we saw 614,000 ICS cyber attacks. That was their 2015 data. And I'm looking at it going, no, you didn't. <laughs> like, you just... Lights are on, water's working, something's wrong with these numbers. Like you're counting port scans on a firewall, I guarantee it. Um, so we've got this chasm between 600,000 on the upper end, and that's about where the metrics all sound, because nobody likes to report small metrics. They like to say, we saw super advanced stuff. Nobody ever gets compromised and like, dude, it was basic. Like, I don't even know why the security team's still here. Like, it's just, nobody does that, right? So it's always super advanced and really jacked up numbers. Um, so that's what we were working with. That's what we were trying to combat. Um, we got little Bobby here saying, um, Alice walks in. Alice says, what are you doing? And little Bobby says, well, I'm installing next-gen software to protect me against foreign governments. And Alice says, why is there a pop-up saying you still need to patch your system? And little Bobby says, oh, I'll get to that later. Uh, I, I, I do this again ahead of the sort of incidental infections. And I'll, and I'll say this once, and I'll say it very bluntly. Your adversary has PowerPoint in management, too. Right, they're human threats. No adversary, like I, and, I, and I'm, I'm allowed to say that I was on offense, not like pen testing red team, so I was on offense uh, in the government uh, before, after I did intel and defense. And at no point in my day did I think to myself, hmm, how do I develop malware or do this campaign in a way that's really going to impress the defender? Like, that's not my consideration. Like, it was not to show up in the Kaspersky report and look good. Like, that was not a consideration on operations, right? It's get on with your day. You've got a lot of other things to do. So basic works. And if you're smart, you stick to the basics. Because if somebody gets compromised with a basic piece of malware, they don't call the big instant response firms and they look the other way. And if you're an adversary, that's good. So let's talk about some of the basic stuff and try to return the metrics. So what we did with this Mimix project, conveniently named Mimix, basically off of malware and modern ICS, is we try to have some census data. Because I talk about the hype a lot and trying to combat the hype, but I want you to have real numbers. So if people ask you questions, you have fact-driven numbers that you can talk about. We looked only in virus total and only in public databases, because everybody uses VirusTotal as basically their free you know, sandbox, which is bad, please stop it. And unless you're in ICS, keep doing it, because I like watching. But like, uh, you know, I'm kidding, don't do that. But anyway, so 
uh, use the virus total data, and your first question is probably, well, how many ICS locations are actually using virus total? A uh, lot. And even if you don't think you are, at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some of the biggest offenders. The biggest offenders are your AV companies and your outsourced IT security teams. To be an AV company in that virus total list, you have to submit tons of malware back. So they sanitize your data and then submit it. And the IT security companies that are outsourced, a lot of the smaller ones I've seen, just do a bulk API submit off every file they find to virus total which means they're exfiltrating your data for you. So go back and look at your service level agreements to make sure this isn't going on. But anyway, so that's what we worked with. And like all good hunting, we started with a hypothesis. We said, what do we want to do? So we said, we specifically for hypothesis one, want to find non-targeted intrusions, just incidental malware infections in industrial control system locations, not honeypots, not uh, enterprise networks of an energy company, specifically in industrial control systems themselves. To do that, we developed uh, Yara rules. There's some classes and stuff going on for Yara as well this week, or this, this uh, two days. Yara ends up being a great tool, basically just pattern matching, uh, kind of like grep on steroids. But we looked and developed Yara rules specifically for the right ICS file paths, software versions, taking some of that knowledge of what ICS equipment is and, and when it's actually installed in the right file path and not by a researcher, and looked in those locations across the data, and then mined out uh, what we could find. We ended up looking at 15,000 samples over three months. So we found 15,000 legit, 15, legitimately infected ICS software. Um, so already installed in the location, already running properly, um, already properly set up in, in the different environments. 15,000 infections over three months. But that's not a fair metric, and it needs refined. Because first of all, we can have duplicates. If a virus gets in a, a you know an environment, infects it, and you submit it, you might have a hundred submissions for one infected site. So we then started going down the list and looking and grouping them into different industries and the different vendors around those different industries and looking at different locations and, and trying to deduplicate the data. On a conservative estimate, we found 3,000 unique sites across the three months that we did the analysis. Um, so we extend that out to say in, in any given year, there are likely three to 4,000, so we're very, very conservative on the numbers, likely in any given year, three to 4,000 industrial control system sites that are getting infected just with incidental malware. So there's stuff going on. It's not as low as the 200 numbers, but it's also not the 600,000 numbers. So a nice base census metrics to work on. Um, I like word maps because they look crazy, um, but this is the only thing I wanted to highlight. When we looked at the word maps of all the different infections and what they were, that giant arrow that maybe you can barely see, it, it, that giant arrow is pointing to the word Stuxnet. It's not well represented in the data. You are more likely to get infected by Civis and Configure than you are by Stuxnet. So quit focusing all of your resources on, I want to defend against the NSA, FSB, 8200, and GRU, and start thinking about the operators bringing in USBs and what you do about that. Because it turns out it's the same. When you do defense, you're raising the bar against everything. Anyways, so these were the most common infections, just for those that are grabbing the slides after the conference that want to look through them all. Basically just looking at some of the highest hitting samples of malware. And go figure, a lot of it is virus-type malware, stuff that's just spreading and propagating. Interestingly enough, though, there was lots of Trojans as well that weren't just spreading around. So you would have to have a little bit better uh, infection routine instead of just USBs and things like that. We ended up finding some things like Trojanized versions of ICS installers that were being targeted against environments. We'll talk about it a little bit later. So base metrics for everybody to use going forward, three to 4,000 in any given year, incidental infections, not non-targeted. So about, what about some of the targeted stuff? Can we, can we try to figure out if there's any ICS themed stuff that shows that the adversaries are, are maybe uh, investing some time in this and are specifically targeting but not using crazy level malware? Uh, so we looked and said, you know what, there's, there's very little known about this. If you look into the ICS community today and you look for ICS themed malware infections, they don't get a lot of press, right? It's not like the big threat intelligence report coming out. Um, so there's really only three that you can find that are referenced at all. Um, Operation Electric Powder uh, was an Israeli company that put it out. Good, good, really good work by them looking at some specific targeting of an energy company. Didn't affect the ICS, didn't get to the ICS, but an adversary who was very, very much targeting this energy company in Israel. 
We saw ransomware masked as a Rockwell update. Um, so that was interesting, but it was just the zip file was named that. It wasn't anything crazy. Um, and then we had Iron Gate from the FireEye crew, um, which was a cool discovery, but it was a point of, it was a proof of concept. It looked like maybe a researcher made it. They submitted it themselves to Virus Total. It was never in the wild, never infected anybody. So to date, before the project, we haven't seen ICS themed malware that was actually infecting ICS sites. Oh, that's a problem. Can we, can we return some of those metrics to the community? So we looked for theming around ICS. Like if we were an adversary and we were going to target an ICS, how would we do it? And how would we do that theming? One of the first ones we found was back from 2011 that no one had reported on. And it specifically relates to the nuclear materials management and safety um, organization. So if you're in the government and you deal with nuclear uh, equipment, you deal with nuclear power generation stations, NMMS is a group that you're very familiar with. And we saw back in 2011 that a phishing campaign went out against select nuclear sites, um, themed specifically for them, didn't end up impacting that we could see anywhere else. And it was just a regular Trojan, nothing crazy. Again, it's not ICS tailored malware, it's just ICS themed malware. But by all accounts, showing a level of uh, understanding the community and targeting. The next one we found, we ended up finding about 13. So there's about 13 out there um, that we found that were specifically theming towards ICS and targeting them. The one that we found that was pretty interesting, though, is the Siemens uh, themed installer. I, I want to be very clear, this has nothing to do with the Siemens folks. Like, is Siemens systems insecure? It has nothing to do with this, right? This is just theming. Like, I can theme it for anything. But the adversaries decided to theme it for Siemens themed installers, specifically for the applications that work on the control systems and interact with the control systems themselves. Because if you want to bypass all the defenses, why not just trojanize legitimate software that they're going to install anyways? And what was interesting about this to me is we found di 10 different uh, binaries, 10 different samples, uh, and they were in different locations starting back from 2013 to 2017. Right? We actually found, we stopped the research in March and we found a, a sample still in March. So for four years, an adversary has been theming their malware specifically for Siemens installers and hitting different locations around the world. So uh, basic stuff, it's nothing crazy. It's just uh, execute on the environment, reach out to the internet, grab the right payload, uh, and, and be able to execute and run on the system. Does it take down the power grid? No, it just gives you remote access, right? It's, it's a remote access tool um, for adversaries. So all that stage one kill chain stuff, nothing stage two, is, oh my God, the power grid's coming down, none of that. Where in the world were we seeing it? Um, based on the uploads and based on the environments that are getting infected, we saw the majority of which, uh, six of them, were in the United States. We saw one in uh, a European country and we saw two in China. Um, the interesting thing about this as well is it, it might just be a selection bias off collection because how many Chinese-based companies are using virus total? Probably not as many as American-based companies. So there's, there's a selection bias in there. But I, I just want to note again, from a moving from hype down to we can have base metrics back to actually seeing that targeting is going on. So do we need to be taking care and watching and researching and thinking about ICS security? Yes, the adversaries are interested. Is it because the power grid is going to go down at any moment? No. There's, there's the whole sliding scale in there of just responsibility around this. Um, as I close it out, we'll look at the user behavior and poor operational security. We have good, some good talks coming up about virtualization. We have good talks about OPSEC later today. Um, some good stuff with OSINT and MICA. Uh, we've got some great stuff that'll help you with this next section. And this is why I wanted to end it as I looked at um, the, the different talks today. I feel this aligned very closely with a lot of the talks that are going on. So our third and final hypothesis was, why is this data getting up there, right? Like, how, how is this happening? And our hypothesis was that non-ICS security trained teams were just submitting all this stuff that they didn't understand. And it turns out uh, that was what it was. Also, your antivirus is not really good at picking up what legitimate and bad ICS stuff looks like. There is a lot of false positives. So we found that completely legitimate ICS software was routinely, very, very uh, routinely getting comp uh, popped as malicious software by AV. It's another reason a lot of people don't install AV all over the ICS. Because AV companies haven't shown that they understand what ICS stuff is, and they just just destroy all of our equipment. So it's one of the reasons. Anyways, so from nothing but the, the public data sets we, uh, of the legitimate stuff, not malicious now, we saw over 120 different project files in those three, in those three months. 
So people that were submitting the actual logic that goes onto the control systems with their internal very sensitive data directly onto these uh, public databases. We saw stuff uh, that definitely shouldn't be going off there that was getting flagged by antivirus. So this document got flagged as antivirus as being malicious, and so it got submitted. I don't know why it didn't get sanitized correctly. Surely AV companies would never do anything wrong. Um, but it uh, got submitted, and it was a very, very sensitive document around incidents in the nuclear community. And we fuzzed out the details, but it was identifying incidents that were going around the U.S. community, and specifically, I think, two sites, yeah, two specific violations that occurred in the nuclear sector. That's not information we want on a public database, right? That's not, that's not typically a good thing. Um, we saw a lot of uh, substation layouts and things that were getting submitted as flagged by, as malicious by antivirus for whatever reason. Uh, and it was like, here's exactly what our network looks like, or here's exactly how our systems are set up, or here's all the internal IP ranges that we use to manage these systems with all these passwords. And it's like, oh my gosh, don't put that up there. Um, we saw a bunch of installers. If you were an adversary wanting to transition into that stage two of the kill chain, you would need to test, right? I told you, like one substation in Maryland, Baltimore region, completely different than the BG&E substations that are just down the road. All these things are set up differently. Even if they have same vendors, the physical process and engineering is different. So you'd want to be able to set up a test lab. We found all the different uh, very, very expensive installers and key generators for all the major vendors. So you can just download their software with the key generator and have your own environment. How expensive is some of this? Uh, as an example, I wanted to do some research into GE Simplicity equipment one time. And I asked, because uh, Dragonfly was targeting GE Simplicity, um, this threat group, but I said, hey, GE, I'm a researcher. I promise I'll behave. Can you just like give me a copy of Simplicity? And they're like, oh, we have a student discount. So I'm like, awesome, I want that. How much is it? And it was more expensive than my house. And so I was like, no, I don't, I don't think you and I have the same definition of students. Um, uh, never mind. But now I can just go download it for free with the key generator. So we don't want our adversaries to have access to this stuff. Um, we had one utility that was indexing their entire public website uh, since 2012. Uh, and indexed 130 different file directories and, and paths on virus total for the last five years. So that's that's good. Um, again, what I would note for some practices here, number one, use VT as a data source. If you're a researcher in this community, you're trying to do some fun stuff, I get you excited about ICS, you're like, I want to do some ICS stuff. Virus total is a great place to start. Also, I have a blog, robertinley.org. There's a blog like four down that's just a whole resource section of, so you want to get started in ICS. And it's like, here's all the YouTube videos, here's packet captures, here's everything you can get going on. We need more people in this community. I want you to come to this community well-informed. If you find something and you're like, oh my gosh, no one has ever found this before and it's a major nation state attack and it's going to take down the grid, hold up, all right? Like, no one's ever found it before and it's super, super important. Maybe, let's, let's put some thought process into it, right? I don't want people going out uh, talking to media about their latest discovery to find that it's a honeypot, it's Stephen Hilt up in your honeypots. Um, so use VT as a data source. Grab some installers and things off there if you want. Grab some uh, test environments to go up on. I don't know if that violates a dozen terms of service, but uh, technically you're not clicking through the terms of service, so I think you're okay. I'm not a lawyer. And uh, don't submit your stuff to it, because again, what we found was it's all the outsource teams, it's all the AV vendors. Not all of them are bad, by the way. I have a lot of love and respect for a lot of AV teams. You look at a lot of threat research, it's those guys that are doing some awesome stuff. Um, that being said, though, it's just not made for ICS. Uh, so be very careful there. So some key takeaways as I end out uh, what we're doing here. First of all, industrial cyber attacks, they're worth understanding. It's understandable that a lot of people are interested in them. And you're a, a, probably a smart technical person by being here. Statistics would say not everybody in the room is smart, but let's give it to you. Like every, everybody's here is probably smart. Um, I imagine that your peers, your loved ones, the people that you know, look to you when stuff happens. Like, can you explain this? So ICS is going to be one of those things that's probably useful to be smart on because questions get asked about that a lot. Um, security in the ICS contributes to reliability. We generally see that even simple things like infections can cause issues in environments, shutting down operations. I've seen uh, two major news headlines come out around a uh, piece of malware was found in a German nuclear facility and shut down the facility. Like, the malware didn't, they shut it down for safety reasons, but yeah, that's one of like 3,000 that's happening each year is, is our point. Um, so there's some, some base metrics for you to work from. 
some some opportunities to do some good things and have some fun, uh, and, and generally uh, a little bit better understanding, I hope, of ICS attacks and sort of how they occur. So with that, uh, if you want to be in touch, uh, my Twitter handle's up there, my email's there. Dragos is actually a Maryland-based company, so if you ever want to come in and play with control systems, stop by. Uh, we've got little Bobby here that says, "You look." Matt says, "You look like you haven't eaten in days." And little Bobby's like, I, "I haven't." But and Matt says, "Why not?" He goes, "Well, my fridge, toaster, and oven are all infected with ransomware, but at least my artificial intelligence is protecting me from China." So uh, have a good understanding of all the fun stuff you're going to do these next two days, but definitely have a good understanding of risk as well, and trying to say maybe I don't need to stop every single nation state attack. Maybe I need to start addressing some of the issues that are actually causing problems in my organization today. So with that, uh, I think we have time for like two questions at max, and uh, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, All right, yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. All right, thanks. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, and the data set and everything else as well. Just hit us up. Yeah, yeah, no problem. We've been sharing it up to the different uh, researchers that wanted uh, to work on this, so no problem. The what? Oh, the New York Dam. That was a funny one. So I'll, since Jim's being a troll up here, um, there was a New York Dam that got hacked. You've probably heard about that one as well, maybe. They were like, oh my god, the Iranians. And the DOJ actually did an indictment on it um, and, and made a big deal out of it and said, these Iranian hackers hacked this dam. Um, so here's the real story. Uh, I had to go on Fox News for this. I never go on Fox News. If you, ha I don't care about your political biases and leanings and stuff, but it's not a news source I'm super excited about. Uh, but they were like, we, we're going to talk about this. You can come on. I'm like, all right. Uh, and so they're hyping it up. They're like, a nation state cyber attack on a dam in New York. And uh, the Iranians are attacking. This is war. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. And so I get on there. I'm like, yeah, it's not how it happened. And and you just see his face. Like, he just had, like, this senior member of the DHS telling him that it was a big deal. And here I am being like, nah, that's not how it happened. Um, it was actually a case that I worked in the government, which was previously classified, but you know everything gets leaked these days. Um, they, they declassify the details, so I'm allowed to talk about it. Uh, one day, I get called up. I'm sitting over in the intelligence community. I get passed some data, and I get told, Iranian actors are targeting infrastructure in the United States. Can you look into it? I'm like, oh, okay. And I validated it, and it really was the Iranian actors. And so the attribution was solid in the case, at least from our standpoint. It really was Iranian actors targeting some infrastructure sites. But I looked at it, and it was just what looked like a basic HMI, human-machine interface, with no elements of control. You couldn't do anything. I mean, the Iranians could stare at it really intensely, but it wouldn't do anything. And so I passed back to the DHS, and I said, yeah, it's, it's this place. It's called Bowman Dam, but there's like 53 Bowman Dams in the United States or something. Like, don't go, like, don't freak out. Whatever you do, don't freak out. What is the exact opposite of freaking out? Briefing the president. <laughs> yeah, I feel so bad for President Obama. Uh, you know, like I'm sure he just got tired of cyber people. Uh, but so the DHS and NKIC and everybody else briefs up to him, being like, "There's an Iranian cyber attack against a hydroelectric facility in the United States." And this is not what I said at all. And uh, they call me back and they're like, "Hey, we need you to investigate this pretty quickly." And I'm like, "No, it's it's really not a big deal, guys." And they're like, "No, the president wants updates every 15 minutes." I'm like, "What? <laughs> like, what did you, what did you do?" Um, so we usually joke that there's no black helicopters that people fly around in the government. This was one of those times there were, uh, because uh, we called up AT&T and said, hey, because it was a cell provider that was hanging off the HMI, called up AT&T and said, hey, um, can you tell us where this IP address is? Because the way you do allocation, I have no idea. And they're like, no. I was like, please? And they're like, no. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> um, so, and everyone's always like, the intelligence community spies on you. Like, we can't even do who is. So anyways, uh, it's like... <laughs> We were looking at it, and we were like, so finally got AT&T to say, like, what quadrant of the United States it was in. And while the FBI and everybody else is flying out to Bowman Dam in, in uh, I think, Oregon uh, or Nevada region, because that's what they told the president. And they get there, and it's, and it's a dam that if you had managed to obstruct, it was like six, 7,000 people downstream from it. The problem is it's an earthen dam. Like, you're not, you're not hacking dirt, right? It's, like, it's not going to go well for you. Uh, so anyways... Long story short, find out it's this Bowman Dam in New York. They fly out, they talk to the guy on the phone, the the operator of it, and say, hey, this is the DHS. Uh, I didn't work for the DHS, by the way. Anyways, this is the DHS. You're being attacked by Iranians. We need to get to your facility, which is, like, not the way to start a conversation. Because the guy was getting haircut at the time. was like, this is fishing, and hung up. <laughs> like, <laughs> user training 101 right there. 
Anyways, so uh, long story short, they go out there. It's a dam that's maybe like knee high. Um, if you manage to hack it, you might flood some rich people's like carpet. Um, but it was not worth anything. And it, yeah, it made it all the way to Fox News. DOJ still went forward with it, but it was not a big deal. Anyways, thanks, everybody. Awesome. That's nice. Oh, nice. I like that. You, you, you uh, like Star Wars. Yeah.